Welcome to the My Friend the Friar podcast, and thanks for listening. If you like My Friend the Friar and want to support us, please consider subscribing or following us if you haven't already done so. And if you found us on YouTube, then don't forget to click the notification bell when you subscribe so you'll be notified of new episodes when they release. Thanks again, and God bless. Okay. Man, I'm, I don't know why I'm, like, winded after chasing after the dang cats. And I I mean, you saw me. I went, like, three feet to the door, and I'm winded. Uh, la, 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 la. Sorry. Okay. Here we go. I'm John Lee, and I'm joined by Father Stephen Sanchez, a discalced Carmelite priest. Good afternoon, Father. Good afternoon. All right. Before we get started, because I'm really bad at this... Um, I want to take a quick moment, thank everyone for listening, and remind everyone that if you're enjoying the podcast, please subscribe um, on whatever podcast platform you find us on, and uh, share us with your friends, um, find us on YouTube, do the whole bell notification, thumbs up kind of stuff, and um, don't know where we're at in the planning releasing thing but um if if we have something like a google form or something set up on the podcast for you guys to send in suggestions or things you want to hear more about um uh feel free to fill one of those out and send them our way and then with that i think we're ready we're talking today we're still talking about martyrs yes and uh we're doing our Nerd, history nerd stuff. <laughs> yeah. Diving into uh, that whole tradition or that whole, yeah, it is a tradition, that whole history of the church and the blood of the martyrs and how the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church through their witnessing to the truth of Jesus Christ. Last time we talked about... Uh, the martyrs of England and Wales and the Japanese martyrs, which was a very fascinating uh, dive into that history. An exquisite pronunciation. I, I'm, I think I mispronounced of course. pronunciation. How do you say it? Pronounce, pronounce, <laughs> whatever. You did better than I could do on those Japanese names. I speechified. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and today we're going to talk a little bit about the, the martyrs of China, and also the martyrs of, uh, during the French Revolution, the French martyrs. It's interesting that when I was, when I was doing the research for this, that the Catholic Encyclopedia says that Catholic missions have, had been going to China since the Middle Ages. So I don't know what that means. Well, the Middle Ages means from, from the year 500 to the year 1500, but I'm going like, I just don't know who or when was the first mission. But Yeah, it's kind of a big window. There's always been, yeah, it's a big window. You're like a, th- uh, a thousand years, like, so trying to figure out, okay. So anyway, the, whenever uh, the, tr- the church speaks of the martyrs of, of China, there is a specific set uh, or a number of those who died for the faith. Yeah, and we're, we were in this... <laughs> going up to the late 16, early 1700s, I think, in the last time we were talking about martyrs. And so now yeah, we're in for the, the 1800s. Japanese martyrs. Yeah, now we're going into the 1800s, and it actually spreads into the 1900s as well. Yeah. So whenever the church speaks of the martyrs of China or the Chinese martyrs, they're talking about 119 specific uh, people that have been beatified or canonized, and they died, or I'm sorry, they were beatified between the years 1889 and 1856. And so in the research uh, that I found out was uh, that there were five bishops, three Franciscans, one Dominican, one bishop from the Paris Foreign Mission Society, one Dominican bishop-elect, so he didn't get to be ordained bishop because he was sent to his glory, before that, uh, 25 uh, European priests, nine Franciscans, six Dominicans, four Jesuits, three lay members of the parish foreign missionary congregation, four Chinese secular priests, one European Franciscan lay brother, seven Chinese seminarians, 
seven sisters of the Congregation of the Franciscan Missionaries of Mary, eight Chinese catechists, the rest being laypersons, eight of whom were under the age of 20. So the age uh, of the martyrs spanned from 72 as the oldest and the youngest being nine years old. My gosh. Um, Do you know what is what a Chinese secular priest is off the top of your head? I've never heard yeah, that, that would be That would be like, it's a, a secular priest. They talk about secular priests. This, that's old language. Secular, pli- blah, blah, blah. secular priests versus regular priests. Regular priests was a way of speaking of religious priests because they have a, they live a rule and they have a, uh, they, they live uh, what they call the the regular life. In other words, the monastic life or religious life, or they, they have a rule or a guide. So they they're called regular priests. I don't know what they're called. Why they use that? And the secular priest is just another way of speaking of a diocesan priest. So seven it would be seven diocesan priests. But it's just an old language of of differenti- differentiation between those that belong to a religious congregation and those that are mm-hmm. under the diocesan bishop. So. Diocesan or secular priest versus regular priest. That's what that means. The, the more you know, I guess. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> language, right? That's something the Catholic Church loves too. Is is specific language for very specific things. Yes, we're very. We're, yeah, that's that's part of being in the West. And so, it was interesting that one of the things that that I had studied or had read was that under the Mongol. Empire, which you would think would be very vicious. Uh, so the Christians were tolerated during the Mongol Empire. And when the Mongol Empire fell, uh, Christianity began to be resisted by those uh, pre- uh, following dynasties. And they were resisted because there was a fear that they would lose the tradition of ancestor worship which is very much part of Chinese uh, religiosity to, to worship your ancestors. So there, were fear, there was a fear of losing ancestor worship and uh, the influential uh, philosophy of Confucius, so they were afraid of losing Confucianism. In other words, those things that they found themselves or that they believed identified them as a Chinese country in terms of religiosity, right? So they were afraid of losing that or maybe... A better way of saying that would be they were afraid of becoming uh, westernized, right, or, or yeah. Europeanized. Yeah. So Christianity then began to be continuously persecuted uh, and discouraged, and so there was a continual persecution. Not as not as uh, bad as it was in Japan, but there was a continual dis- a persecution of the faith during the 1500s and the 1600s. The first martyr uh, uh, in China was the Spanish Dominican Francisco de Capillas. He was 41 years old and he was beheaded in Fukien or uh, F-U-K-I-E-N. I have absolutely no idea how to speak Chinese. <laughs> Fukien. Yeah, you're, you're, so he was, he was beheaded your in... Your name skills <laughs> only beheaded in, they stayed at in Japan. In, in Japan, <laughs> yeah. Japan, like I, I don't even want to try this. I'm very sorry if I've butchered that. But he was beheaded in 1648 in January. Oh, so uh, yeah, so, so I, I misspoke earlier looking at the notes. So this is kind of happening the same time that everything is going on in the UK. It, it's 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 going on in the UK, but it continues into the 19th into the 19 into the 19th century into the 1800s. So the, the first the first martyr was in 1648, but the continuation of the persecution continues into the 1800s. Okay. Right? So I'll talk a little bit about that too. So when the Ming Dynasty falls, so the, Man, the Ming Dynasty falls, and then there's the, the dynasty of Manchu, which we, I guess that's where you get Manchurian, the, the, mm. the language Manchurian. Mm-hmm. So the establishment of the Manchu court, the Jesuits were able to persuable the emperor uh, Kangxi, 
TSI, to grant laws of religious tolerance in 1692. So there was a period of tolerance, but then the persecutions again started again in 1717. And then the next uh, person to die, the next person to be martyred, was uh, Bishop Pedro Sanz. He was 68 years old, uh, and he was also beheaded in Fukien. He was beheaded in 1747. Then, 1748, the next year, Bishop-elect Francisco Serrano, who was 53 years old, is beheaded, along with uh, Juan Alcobert, who was 54, Francisco Diaz, who was 35, Joaquin Royo, who was 57, and they, they were strangled, were strangled to death. Mm. So... Then, so this is 1747, 1748. The persecutions continue into the 1800s. There's a Treaty of Nanking in 1842. And the European governments, when they established this treaty with China, they forced um, China to let up on the persecutions. And so they let up on the persecutions. And then in 1846, so we're now in the 1800s, the French obtained the emperor's permission to have his subjects uh, be baptized, become Christian. So then in 1858, there's another treaty, the Treaty of Tientsin, revoked the anti-Christian legislation, but the persecution still pretty much remained in the popular culture. So the problem, the big problem came after the Boxer Rebellion in, uh, in the 1800s. So after, in 1898, under Emperor uh, Se Echui, uh, T-S apostrophe E-U-C-H-I, resentment grew uh, over the reforms that were forced upon China by the European powers, by the Western powers. So there is a natural kind of a a resentment like, why are we allowing other governments to tell us what to do? This is our country, kind of the idea of uh, sovereignty, right? there That they were a sovereign nation. Mm -hmm. So then that's what how the Boxer Rebellion began. So you had the Boxer Rebellion that occurred in 1900. So it's during the Boxer Rebellion that these uh, Chinese uh, subjects of the emperor attacked all Westerners and Christians. The rebellion lasted two months, but during those two months, over 30,000 Catholics were massacred. Man. So, okay, that's, again, this whole idea of uh, xenophobia, right? Yeah. Uh, being afraid of the foreigner and being afraid of the Westerner and, again, not understanding what the faith is about. The whole idea of sovereignty and associating then religion or religiosity with, with sovereignty, not being able to see, and for us as Catholics, not being able to see that the, the faith is, is transcultural. It's, it, it's not bound by a particular culture, and there's, there's cultural adaptations of the faith uh, throughout the Catholic uh, Church. So I guess a misunderstanding of things. Um, and sometimes it has to do, I think, with the missionary efforts as well in terms of how are the missionaries are presenting themselves in the particular culture. Are they trained? Uh, are they culturally sensitive? I, I remember one of the things that the Jesuits did that, that got in trouble in China was that in China, white is the color of mourning. You wear white, also in Japan as well. White is the color of mourning, of grief, right? Uh, so red is the color of joy. The red is the color of joy. So they, the Jesuits started uh, adapting the liturgical colors. Instead of using white for Easter, they would use maybe red for Easter because it was a joyful time. And so, of course, the church was kind of upset and resisted the Jesuit uh, so adaptation of those things. But there has to be some sort of cultural adaptation of, mm -hmm. of the faith as it goes into these areas, different areas, and becoming... Uh, culturally aware and culturally sensitive as as we move into these areas where the gospel has not been heard or the gospel hasn't been preached uh, in its fullness, right? Yeah. So I thought that was an interesting interesting thing there in terms of uh, the Chinese uh, missionary effort. Yeah, and that is really kind of interesting too because there's 
the the church allows for a lot of flexibility in some ways and then in other ways it's very inflexible and uh, for example like i i think i heard that the um they wanted to to see could they do communion wine with um like rice wine in the east Mm. Uh, because it's more readily available than grapes, right? And the answer is no. Right. Like we can't change the the species of the um, of the hosts, right? The, yeah, the Eucharistic species. Yeah, yeah. So, and it has to have it has to be wine. It has to be alcohol. So, it can't be non-alcohol. It has to be the from the must of grapes. It has all these. It has all these requirements, and you're wondering, like, okay, so. Again, I, all these things have come about whenever we have a legislation. Legislation is because there's been an abuse. Mm-hmm. So somewhere, somehow, somebody abused something, and so the church decided, well, we can't allow abuse. So we need to, we need to set regulations, right? So that's why we have all this legislation in terms of what is uh, allowable and not allowable in terms of yeah. how to celebrate the, the Eucharist and the 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 form of the the matter of the of the Eucharistic species in terms of unleavened bread for the West, wine, so colors of the liturgy and stuff. And so I think those are important. We need guidelines. We need we need uh, those rails to keep us from going off. But mm. at the same time, there has to be some sort of awareness of the culture that we're coming into and how do we what is the essential, right? What are the essential things? What are the things that we cannot change? Like you can't say, you know, th- there, there is, uh, you can't deny the Trinity or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, th- those are essential to the faith. Yeah. But what what is it that, that it, that is essential? And how do you gradually educate and catechize these people into the fullness of the faith? And again, so what is most important, whether, you know, it's, beeswax candle uh, <laughs> or is it oil candle right and those things are important but they're not how there's there's levels of of importance that, yeah. that we have to become aware of too yeah and the church how many um uh, i would maybe i wouldn't be surprised if you would know this somehow um but there's all the different rites within the church too that if you are in communion with the church um like there's some that I guess are more Middle East um, or or Western Europe, like the just the different liturgical rites. But there are things yeah. that, again, they have to be in line on. Like you can't just um, yeah. just do whatever you want to, and still be in communion with the church. There's a whole department in the Vatican that deals with the Eastern churches, and it's called the, the Oriental churches, mm. the Eastern churches. So it'd be any, anything other than West, which would be Roman or Latin, right? Latin, the, the Roman Latin, right? And then in the East, you'd have all sorts of, you know, whether it's uh, the Maronite, right, which is m- mostly Lebanese, you have the Maronite rite, you have the Byzantine rite, you have the Malabar rite, which is from India. I think it's called the Syro Malabar rite. You have the ancient, ancient Mozarabic rite that is only celebrated in the Cathedral of Seville, uh, trying to maintain it, keep it alive. I don't know if it still is, but there is only one place in the world that it's still celebrated. Uh, there's the. Uh, there are other Eastern churches that are attached to or connected to this to the Roman church under the sea of Rome. And then there are others that have separated themselves. The Eastern Orthodox uh, churches, uh, the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox. You have um, the Antiochine, the, the, under the Antioch, the Antiochine uh, Eastern church, which is separated. So... There's all sorts of, of ways of celebrating the Eucharist. As for us in the West, the Latin rite, the Roman rite, we have our way of, of celebrating. So, for example, in some Eastern rites, you use leavened bread, and it's legitimate. It's 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 an acceptable. It is the way they celebrate, and it's 
and it doesn't invalidate it for us. We use unleavened bread, and so for us, it has to be unleavened bread. You cannot you cannot use yeast in the hosts for us. Now, so why is that a thing? I don't know. <laughs> That's the tradition for for the Roman rite and the tradition for the other rites. Yeah, and it's been a while since I've heard anything coming out of the church in China, but I feel like there's a while there and maybe the like after 2010 where there was all sorts of kind of goofy goofiness going on over there or like drama or scandal. Um, well, so is any of that China... maybe still tied to just these things that have been going on for centuries over there, like culturally? What the communists did what the Chinese government did was since they saw that it was difficult to eradicate the Catholic Church, the Chinese government established their own national Catholic Church, where it's not associated with the Sea of Rome. It's not associated with with the Catholic Church. They've they've created their own church. It's it's a like state church, church. Of England, it's a national huh? church. Yeah, pretty much. And so and then there's the underground church, which is the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church or the church that is associated to or in communion with Rome, that's an underground church. Uh and it exists there almost parallel to the national church. And so of course, the underground church is persecuted because the Chinese government or the communist government wants people if you're going to be uh a Christian, we'd rather you come to the state-run church because then they, they're they the ones that uh, ordain bishops and name bishops, and they're, it's it's the Chinese government. It's just, again, it's a, it's like a, it'd be like for, for us <laughs> in the United States, it's like, you know, okay, you have the Social Security Department, right? So, okay, so <laughs> here's the the state national Catholic church. It's, it's very strange there. Uh, so that's still there's still tension there, uh, a lot of tension between the Holy See and uh, the communist government there in China about that, the persecution of the church and the establishing a, a, a false uh, state church and calling it Catholic. So it's still there. Yeah, it's a lot more subtle now. In fact, one, there's one I forgot the name of the the, the bishop. There's some bishop, a Chinese bishop that was tortured and imprisoned. He was imprisoned for, for decades uh, before the Holy See finally uh, managed to get him free, set free. So yeah, the persecution still exists uh, in various forms. Hmm. Well, so maybe again, maybe it's part of, part of the whole idea of church. Since the church speaks up for the poor, this, the, the church speaks up for the marginalized, the church, you know, is always, yeah, looking for to establish uh, some sort of justice and, and, and the dignity of the human person. The state does not like that. The state doesn't want to be pushed. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about some of the, the people that were killed in, in Latin America. Yeah. Well, and so all, all this is going on. There's even more martyrs in France at this time. Yeah. Um, so during this time, uh, again, in the late 1700s, you have uh, the revolution that begins in France. Uh, the revolution was caused because of poor economic conditions. The people were not happy with King Louis XVI's uh, foreign policies. And part of the economic uh, recession or, or, or downturn in France was due to the fact that France was involved in the American Revolution as well. So a lot of money was leaving France uh, for wars and uh, other things. And again, the the, the aristocratic uh, oppression of the poor. Right. So the, all this economic war is what, what led to the revolution in France and King Louis the Sixteenth and Queen Marie Antoinette were guillotined. Uh, King Louis in 1793, in January of 1793, and Marie Antoinette uh, in October of that same year. 
So the French Revolution, because they're fighting against the aristocracy and the oppression and the poverty and people don't have enough to eat, right? All those things are happening. Just a couple of days ago is is the time of the the anniversary of the storming of the of Bastille. So Bastille Day is kind of sort of like our 4th of July. So in 1789, they stormed the Bastille. The Bastille was a armory uh, uh, where all the, the king kept all his uh, weapons. And so the poor people stormed the Bastille so they can arm themselves and continue then the, the revolution uh, against the king or the, the aristocracy, the monarchy. So in 1790, the revolutionary, revolutionary government of France enacted a law denying papal authority over the church in France. So then the church itself was outlawed and the government began uh, appropriating lands. So taking lands from the big abbeys, uh, the big monasteries, which is, is interesting because as in the history of the church and the history of the development of cities, a lot of the abbeys and monasteries, as they established themselves, they were the reason <laughs> the city was, was so, founded. Yeah, even there in the first place. Everybody would come. Yeah, they came around to live near the monastery because usually monasteries had enough land and they would, you know, people would help them um, in their lands or the monks and the nuns would produce, have produce and then share it with uh, the the people around them. And so there was a source of income. You had, you had uh, an established religion. You had a place where you could go and worship. And so you had this whole idea of how the church through the religious communities, uh, and by that I mean monasteries and, and, and abbeys and, and convents, began to populate the countryside and people would flock around them, and that's how cities began uh, to be born. It's a place of education, so, too, a lot of times. There was, yes. for a long time, there was nowhere else. You, yeah. you weren't going to learn to read unless you went somewhere where somebody could teach you and, the, you know, you'd have... Somebody was teaching you, and yeah. so the monks were, were doing that, having, having schools and stuff. And so what happens then is now the poor people, they want all that land back. They, again, that's, this is, again, this is an emotional thing, right? Uh, so they want all the land back. It, it doesn't matter that they don't know how to farm or they don't have the animals to farm because they're so poor, but they just, they want the land. And then, then after they start taking the land, then they start actually going into the churches and they start stealing everything from the churches, uh, materials, uh, of course, the gold and uh, the silver, the, the chalices, the tabernacles, all that starts happening, right, in, in 1790. Then in 1793, in Par- 1792, in Paris, three bishops and 200 peace priests were massacred by the mobs uh, in Paris because there was a... a they were having some sort of a national meeting, uh, like a, I don't even want to say government, it was a political parties mm-hmm. were meeting in France. And the, you have these political parties warring with one another. You have those that were supporting the monarchy and the line of uh, the whole idea of having kings. And you have another party that is contrary to that, doesn't want anything to do with the aristocracy and wants to establish some sort of republic. And so then these two parties start fighting with each other and then it hits the fan and all of a sudden there's there's this pandemonium and then all of a sudden you have these mobs and so they start go out and they just start burning down churches and killing priests and so you have three bishops and 200 priests that were massacred in Paris and then there was also other mass executions of priests and nuns in Lyon and hundreds of priests uh, were imprisoned in the port of Roquefort, uh, and so in uh, Roquefort or Rochefort, Fort, uh, there was a big prison. In fact, some of our Carmelite, discalced Carmelite friars were imprisoned there, and three of our friars, I forget uh, what their names are, the cause is still up. They were put on a, on a ship. They were uh, chained uh, onto the ship, and then the ship was just left out on port, and basically starved them to death. So they just die of starvation out there. Mm. So there's different ways in which people were, were tortured again. 
as we said before, uh, some of these people, once they get in power, it's, it's amazing how cruel they can be. So then in 1793, uh, there was a, a democratic club that had been established in Paris, the, the Jacobins. So the Jacobins uh, seized control of the National Convention from the more moderate uh, uh, party. Uh, and so the Jacobins then said that they wanted to de Christianize France. So it was the eradication of Christianity. So it began there, and with the, the Jacobins taking power and what they call the de Christianization of France, we have the beginning of what is known as the Reign of Terror, right? So this is part of uh, the history then of, of the massacre or the martyrs of the Catholic Church in France during the revolution. So the reign of terror was from September 5th, 1793 to July 27th, 1794 under the French Republic. So you, this, I'm sorry, that is the French Republic, the time of the French Republic. And so the reign of terror happens under that first uh, Republic and the reign of terror, uh, there were 20,000 to 40,000 uh, victims. Um, so after the celebration uh, 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 of, this is again, this is in 1793, so it's already, uh, the storming of the Bastille was in 1789, so a few years later they're celebrating the, again, it's like the 4th of July, as they're celebrating Bastille Day in France, uh, our discount Carmelite nuns in uh, Compiègne they were placed under the state and they had to register as wards of the state. They had to promise that they would stop living their community life and so they're placed under the, as wards of the state. So then in 1792 during Easter, all the churches are plundered by the government, not the mob now, but actually the government, the state government goes and plunders all the churches, tries to take all the the treasures that they can again for the the treasury of the state and so then that's in that's in easter and then later on that same year in august of the same year the government ordered that all monasteries be shuttered all be closed down so so in france so in france the it plays out the 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 peasantry they storm bestial in 89 right Right. Uh, in 90, right. they say the, the uh, Pope has no authority over the church, so then the church is outlawed. Right. In 92, Correct. they start killing priests and bishops and um, uh, putting the nuns as wards uh, of, the, of the state and right. uh, sacking the monasteries and stealing all the stuff. Mm -hmm. 93, king and queen are executed. And then between 93 and 94 is the reign of terror where they just start killing tens of thousands of Christians. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mob violence. Yeah, it's the mob takes over. And it so goes quick. The mob is ruling everything. Excuse me? As it, goes, it happens quick. I mean, that's not a very long yes. span of time. And it's, it sounds like total chaos. It, it, it was. It was, it, it was, it caused terror all over Europe because like who, no one had ever executed a king or a queen before. And so all the European countries are going like, what? It's, it was unheard of because you know, the people thought, you know, or felt that there was what they call the divine right of kings. And again, it goes back to the whole Catholic understanding of kingship and, and you have Christ the king and the king is supposed to be sort of a, the manifestation of this benign ruler who takes care of his children and shepherds his people as 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 uh, Christ the king does and so but of course that all as things get corrupted and people corrupt people come into power then they corrupt that very image uh, uh, that they were supposed to to fulfill themselves or their vocation then as leaders and those that shepherd the people, very much like uh, the kings in Israel, you know, who, mm -hmm. again, once they were in power, then they started becoming, you know, not only idolaters, but they, they would cause havoc everywhere uh, for the people that were, they were meant to, to care for. 
So then in, in 1992, uh, the, the nuns are forced to wear civilian clothes to leave their monastery and no longer live in community. So family and friends found them four apartments where they continue to live their religious life. So the 16 nuns were divided into four apartments, and so they lived their community life without living in cloister as they're supposed to, as cloistered nuns. Their family's just trying and to help so them out. so they prayed together and they lived yeah. together. Excuse me? Is it their family's just trying to help them out? Yeah, just trying to find a place for them to live, right? So then when the reign of terror uh, begins uh, in 1794, uh, the apartments were searched and they, the nuns were arrested as enemies of the state on June 22nd of 1794. Then they were transferred to a prison in Conciergerie. I have no idea how I don't speak French. <laughs> on July 10th, they were tried and sentenced to death on July 17th and executed by guillotine that evening. The oldest nun was 78 and the youngest nun was 25. And the reason we know some of their history is because other nuns were imprisoned as well. Some Benedictine nuns were imprisoned as well. And so they were witnesses to the imprisonment and the execution of the nuns. Uh, there's um, there's an opera, for those of you who like opera, there is uh, an opera by Polanc uh, called The Dialogue of the Carmelites, and it's this whole story of the imprisonment and execution of the nuns. And it was based upon a book uh, by Gertrude von Lefort that was called uh, Song at the Scaffold, which is, again, this whole story of how 16 cloistered nuns were tried as enemies of the state and were executed as enemies of the state. The, the mob was stunned at the execution of the nuns. Uh, they were, they all came, they were, as they were all gathered, I think one of the stories that, that I read was very moving. One of the older nuns uh, she they're all tied up right so one of the older nuns and so of course you have their the guards being rude and and being you know mocking them and just being gross to them so as one of the nuns was trying to get off the cart before they got to the guillotine or when they got to the place of where they, they were going to be uh, beheaded the guard sort of knocked her out of the cart and she fell on her face and basically <laughs> broke her face uh so he comes back and kicks her, and she's still alive. And so he lifts her up, and this older nun says, well, uh, thank, you for, thank you for helping me. I did not want to, uh, I, did not, I did not want to be uh, separated from my community. So in other words, she wanted to go and, and be, she knew that they were, they were going to be guillotined, so she wanted yeah. to go and, and be guillotined to, to be beheaded with, with her them. community. Yeah. So they all come to the prioress, and they ask permission from the prioress and the blessing of the prioress and the prioress blesses each one of them gives her permission to go up to the guillotine and they they started singing they were singing either some either the Vene Veni Creator or they were singing something and so in the opera when you see the opera uh, you hear them all singing together and then all of a sudden you hear the guillotine come down and there's one less voice mm. And then the guillotine comes down again, and then one less voice. Wow. And so that's this one less voice, one less voice. There's one final voice. And then that's she's you know, beheaded by the guillotine, and so there's silence. And so it, it is a very, very moving, moving opera. So if you ever want to see it, you can probably rent it on Netflix yeah. or something. Uh, it's, uh, Dialogue of the Carmelites. So what happened, because the there was such shock... <laughs> Everybody was shocked and stunned by by the execution of you know some sixteen uh, cloistered nuns. So ten days after their execution, uh, the leader of the Reign of Terror, Robespierre, he himself is guillotined, and that ends the Reign of Terror. 
So the Benedictine nuns that were in prison were not guillotined, and so they're the reason that that we know about the story of yeah. the Carmelite nuns because they were in prison together with the nuns before the nuns were executed. So then in 1795, there's a new constitution that is approved and creates France's first bicameral legislature. So there's the executive power held by five members called the Directory, and they were approved by Parliament. So that's in 95. So then in 1799, towards the end of 1799, November 9th, there is a young general who we might uh, be familiar with, General Napoleon Bonaparte, who staged a coup d'etat and established himself as the first council of France. Mm. So um, that's how that whole French history uh, unfolded, right? And so that was part of the the martyrdom of those that suffered persecution during during the, the chaos. Uh, I guess people are looking for something to hate, and mm. so that's where they focused their hate was on the church and the... Uh, and because the, 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 the monarchs were Catholics, I mean, most most monarchies were Catholics because <laughs> it, was, it was a Catholic world. So, yeah, there's no, there's no, yeah, there should, that shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, but they, so they, they focused on, on the church and the church was the reason. And so not necessarily the, the corrupt uh, king because they loved uh, Louis XVI's father. Uh, the the other Louis, good, the good Louis, good King Louis, <laughs> and then they hated Louis the Sixteenth. So it's yeah. So they forgot about the good kings, and all they could think of was the corrupt, the corrupt king and their oppression. And so that's. And what was going on with the Pope uh, right now, during this last bit, right with uh, uh, n- uh, Napoleon? The the Pope also okay. So then at that time, of course, we still had the Pope, and we had um, the general uh, Louis. Alexander Bether captured Rome. They went to Rome. They seized the church, or they seized the Holy Father. They imprisoned Pope Pius VI, who died in captivity uh, in France, in uh, Valence, France, in 1799. And so then when Napoleon seized power, he had to make peace with the European countries, and he had to make peace with Rome. So when Napoleon seized control of the government in seventeen in late seventeen ninety nine seventeen or eighteen hundred, then he entered into negotiations with Pope Pius the seventh, and so they signed the Concordant of eighteen o one, which formally ended the uh, the dechristianization of France. Oh. You know, it's people. I, I tell you, I know, and I. <laughs> when we first decided to to talk about more about the martyrs, um, I was trying to think of questions that w- might be helpful to to myself and and anyone who's listening. And one of the questions that came into my head was like, why is this important? And you, I can't help but listen to these stories and go, well, this is like just what the Romans did, and. All these people could have saved themselves if they had just said, oh, no, I'm not Christian, and, you know, just pretended right. to not be Christian, um, but they didn't. Right. And and then it makes me think of, of today, right? Like, p- people who go around saying, well, the United States, and, you know, everyone's so oppressive, and I don't know, whatever. Um, I mean, in France, it's like a, a, a two-year time span, <laughs> or maybe maybe yeah. a little bit more, four years, maybe. And like tens of thousands yeah. of people died s- simply because of their religion. And Correct. in the United States, it, freedom of religion. Like it's it's no wonder that that was on the Founding Fathers kind of wish list, so to speak, you know? Mm-hmm. Because they had lived under religious oppression themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder too In the how- United States, no, not- Go ahead, not go too ahead. many people think about it or talk about it, and I'm not ready to talk about it. I didn't do any research on it, but it, just hearing you talk right now, it just reminded me there was a political party in the United States called the Know Nothing Party mm-hmm. that, again, was very anti-Catholic, and they began to yeah, kill nuns and priests and, and try to burn down churches, and that is the reason why the Knights of Columbus was founded 
was to sit in front of the churches to protect the churches from being vandalized. Yeah. So, I mean, even in the United States, I mean, there's, again, when you have people who are responding from emotion and therefore also for out of ignorance or not knowing, you know, what the church is, then they, they begin to persecute. So is it possible it happens in the future? Of course it is. It's always possible that here in the United States we may have another age of martyrs or another time of persecution. And so yeah. just recently, I mean, I don't know why the, the churches were being vandalized because of uh, this whole thing of the the abortion law in the United States. They're like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, we're Catholics are pro-life, but we're not the only ones. So why don't you go pick on the Baptist or go pick on the Mormons or go pick, yeah. why don't you go pick on somebody else? Yeah. Well, and so. and for goodness sake, look look what happened in Canada. You know what I mean? Like this yes. stuff is happening all over the place. And I think that's why that's why it's, it's the whole like people who who don't know history are doomed to repeat it kind of kind of uh saying, yes. right? Like I don't know, it just it, it boggles my mind. It boggles my mind and um I think it also just really shines a light on like internally i i don't want to be one of these guys right like what a coward <laughs> right. you know like not saying that anybody <laughs> i mean there's there's obviously people out there that are like nope hey sign me up i'll die i'll die for jesus and i want to be that yeah. kind of person but holy cow yeah and these people it weren't is, even creative that is granted so yeah right they, they weren't and, well. In the, the 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 people who were killing them, they weren't even creative like the Japanese were. I mean, the the Japanese were right. like sitting around going like, "Well, golly, how like, can we make yeah? This so how have we not killed <laughs> exactly. the Christians? What can we do? Yeah. Hmm. What is the best? What? Yeah. It's amazing. It is amazing. And so again, who knows? You know, the stadiums that we have in the United States, maybe in the future. <laughs> who knows? Gosh, anything is possible. Yeah. Well, I think that's this is this is where we're gonna end uh, this episode. We've got one more kind of episode in this series, um, at least initially planned. Um, yes. So yeah, to everyone, thank you again for listening. Um, hope you all are, are getting. Thank you for your time. Out of it, yes. Please pray for us. Um, pray for all. Investigate. All the, listen to operas. You know, read books. <laughs> I'm gonna go find that opera. I, I do like an opera and. Um, that sounds yeah, pretty Dialogue powerful. of the Carmelites with uh, Jesse Norman, who recently passed. I think she passed away two years ago. Uh, Jesse Norman, a beautiful voice. Oh, my word. Talk about, oof. Yeah, it makes you cry. So Dialogue of the Carmelites. All right. Look it up. It's everyone's homework. All right. With that, we're <laughs> signing off. God bless. God bless. <laughs>